Sphere IT part five. Uh, the very first presentation would be about Akka Serialization Helper. That's a new uh, open, soft, open source software tool developed at Virtus Lab, mostly by Marcin Zwakowski. He did most of the development. I was just, uh, say, the author of the idea. The idea kind of cropped up naturally within a commercial project which uses Akka uh, Persistent, Akka Persistence, pretty uh, heavily, and required a tool to ensure more runtime safety, that as many checks as possible are, are performed in compile time so that the risk of any failure in runtime, especially Akka serialization, is as low as possible. Some of this might not be, some of these caveats might not be very obvious, especially if you haven't used Akka serialization extensively before. So we'll go through the following caveats and show how Akka serialization helper might help you in dealing with that specific uh, pitfall. The project is currently in alpha beta-ish version. It's not used in production yet. It's used in a pre-production version of um, sort of two commercial projects at Virtus Lab. It's available at Akka Serialization Helper um, Virtus Lab GitHub, and as well as um, as a SPT plugin on Maven Central. So first, the rationale for why we created Ash specifically. So serialization in Akka happens well all the time, or more specifically, every single time when a message needs to leave the given JVM. Even within JVM, the communication uh, can be configured to uh, use to, the messages can be configured to be serialized as well. And that might be useful in let's say testing scenarios. So you might need in test you might want to ensure that every single message is serialized just to well, test the serialization before it goes to production. In production, uh, serialization within the JVM doesn't make much sense. I mean, it, it's just a performance, um, it's just a performance drawback and doesn't give uh, many obvious benefits. So it happens all the time, at least when communication happens between different JVMs. Well, pretty obviously messages are, must be serializable in Akka, but less trivially also events and states, actor states, in the sense of Akka persistence, need to be serialized. Events are dumped into the journal, which might be as simple as a table in, uh, in a Postgres database. And states, actor states, uh, are also depending on your snapshot policy, but uh, states um, are dumped into snapshot um, as well, every single, every few um, events. So three categories of classes are interesting to us from serialization point of view, messages, events, and actor states. So now before we go on to the specific caveats, specific pitfalls of ACA serialization, um, let's say up front that, well, we could specifically, we could, we could theoretically uh, guard ourselves against them just using very extensive testing. Well, this is doable in, in, in theory. Of course, in commercial projects, that's pretty rare to see coverage of, well, even 96%, let alone 100%. Uh, usually it's closer to let's say 60 ish percent the coverage like 96 percent is more common in some very well maintained open source projects but in commercial projects with pressing priorities it's pretty hard to provide um, such such a good coverage especially for such a niche aspect of the program as aka serialization so yeah it, it is possible theoretically that you could well check serialization and deserialization of every single message, event and state and so on. But even if you decide to do so, well, the amount of work, uh, of developer work with respect to code base size is linear. This, I, we don't mean like time um, complexity here. We mean the complexity with respect to developer work. It has linear complexity. So as your code base grows linearly and well, 
yes, the linear growth in number of messages, events, and states. The amount of work that's required to develop and maintain the tests is linear with respect to code base size. But the alternative is static code analysis. Static code analysis, unlike testing, is, well, it's hard and or impossible to test domain-specific scenarios, of course, with some automated tools. But for non-domain or technical issues, just like ACA serialization, there's a pretty good choice, assuming you have um, tools for that uh, particular purpose ready. Uh, it's got constant developer work complexity with respect to code, code base size, unlike testing. So once you put the effort into developing a automated solution for checking for common pitfalls, you basically need zero developer work to, to maintain it. So let's go on to the specific caveats of, of runtime, runtime failures that can happen in ACA serialization. So first piece is missing serialization binding. Every message in or state or event in ACA that needs to be serialized needs to extend a, a trait. This trait is called like, my sir in the example. It might be a trait that's defined by, it's usually a trait that's, that's defined by the application developer, so nothing coming from directly from ACA, rather something that's, that's uh, defined by application developer. And then you need to bind that trait to a particular um, serializer. In this example of uh, a piece from a snippet from application conf, you defi first define the serializer, Jackson JSON, as pointing to the class ACA serialization Jackson, uh, Jackson JSON serializer. And then you bind the trait myser to this Jackson JSON. It means that every single message that extends that particular trait will be serialized with Jackson JSON. You could, in principle, define a few such traits and um, serialize different messages with different serializers in runtime. So using, let's say, Jackson JSON for one thing and Jackson CBOR, like binary format, Jackson CBOR for another messages. So this, this level of indirection helps in uh, defining multiple serializers within the very same application, if need be. But one may ask, okay, but what do I, what if I want to serialize a message or send a message that does not extend this particular trait? Uh, this can happen pretty easily. Uh, you've got the trait my sir again, but for some class, my message that you send as a message, you forgot to add the extends my sir clause. There will be, by default, there is no negative effect in no error, no warning in compile time about that. You basically code compiles um, as usual. You're just gonna receive a message like that, an error like that in runtime. So Java serialization uh, exception attempted to serialize message using Java serialization while uh, certain setting was disabled. The alternative um, is to allow for Java serialization, then ACA serialization will just fall back to Java serialization, which is completely insecure and generally deprecated, also mediocre in terms of performance. So basically, if you forget to extend message class, extend its serializability trait in your message class, you end up with two um, options depending on your configuration. You either the exception like that is thrown, which basically causes the message to never get sent, or um, fallback to Java serialization happens, which uh, would be detrimental to your performance and security, if especially if applied to a larger pool of message, not just a single message, but a larger pool of frequently sent messages uh, within your application. So not a good choice. And it would be pretty good if one could safeguard the application against the forgotten extends clause. So that's the first part of what ACA serialization helper provides. You add an SBT plugin to your uh, plugins SBT. It's basically like 
uh, org threat to slab ash uh, sbt alka civilization helper in the current version the current version is 044 and still well we kind of we follow early semantic versioning so it's, it's still not um, it's not, not tested in production, so we wouldn't claim this version one. But uh, your feedback, of course, is, is uh, very welcome. But as of November 2021, it's still not yet in production. Um, and in build SBT, you need to enable the plugin explicitly. Of course, that's well a little bit more hassle uh, compared to when the plugin would be um, just enabled by default. But uh, it might also be an overkill to enable the plugin by default in every single SBT module. Um, certain modules might not uh, need, might not have anything in common with ACA serialization. So you only need to, we decided to make this plugin let's say, not um, enabled by default so that the users just enable it in the modules that are relevant. And yes, the specific feature for the problem with missing extends a magic annotation you annotate your trait as a serializability trait imported from org to slab ash annotation and that's it basically a compiler plugin that's pulled in by the sbt plugin detects when you send a certain class as a message like passing it as a parameter to tell or in ACA typed when you use it as a type parameter to behavior, detects the classes that are used as messages. And if any such class does not extend the base trait, the trait that has been marked with the annotation, it throws an error in compile time. Like for instance, org my message is used as ACA message, but does not extend the trait annotated with blah, 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 serializability trait. Passing an object of a class not extending base trait as a message might cause Akka to reject the message during runtime, or more specifically, reject the message or fall back to Java, depending on your particular configuration. But that's not a concern of this compiler plugin. So yeah, that's what that's one feature of Akka serialization helper. Basically, like, uh, detect cases like that and. Uh, throw a compilation error in case you forget. The other problem, which is, well, less specific to ACA and just a software-wide problem with compatibility and um, lots of uh, persistent data. In ACA persistence, you have two classes of things that are persisted. Messages are not but messages are serialized but not persisted and events doctor states are well persisted and hence need to be serialized so messages are persisted are serialized just for the sake of being passed um, over tcp between jvms and for events and doctor states uh, you need to serialize them but not for passing between jvms but rather for the sake of dumping them to well disk yeah, to whatever underlying storage can be even postgres so events are dumped to the journal and actor states are saved to the snapshots. Uh, depending on your configuration of snapshots, this might happen like every few, uh, every, party, every few events, for instance. A typical tragic story, again, something not specific to ACA, something that happens across all the software, is that you first save ACA, saves the data, right? Saves the events. Then a new version of the application is deployed and step three, ACA, like when restoring the, the actors um, from the journal, just reads the data and it turns out that the old format is not compatible with the, um, the new classes. This can be changed as simple as, as some refactor intransitively in current class, some refactor changing the name of a field, change something in a, a transitively included class. Yeah, also it's, yeah, it's pretty worth mentioning that it doesn't need to be a change to event or state class itself. That would be pretty easy to spot. You see in git diff then that something changed in the event class or the state class. But what if something changed in a transitively included class? 
would be a really, really tedious task to detect every single instant or instance of such a transitive change manually. It's pretty much undoable um, in, the, in the review, very ineffective at the very least. So instead of uh, letting the reviewers capture things like that, it's better to automate. And we introduced a task called SBT task called Ash Dump Persistent Schema. It does not detect any changes per se. It just dumps, saves the schema of every single class that's involved in uh, persistence, like a persistence. So every single event state and everything that's transitively included, it just saves that to target as a human readable YAML. So a file like that org event type symbol is a trait, then there are some classes like events, some internals, so, which suggests there is some stuff which is not directly used as event, but rather contained in an event, including fields, parent classes, everything that might be relevant for uh, the uh, for compatibility. If you rename some field or change a type of a field, you're going to see a change in a diff in, a, in this dump in this YAML. So what you can do, and that's up to the team to set up in their CIs, is to just compare the dump of persistence for develop and for the current branch. And how we implemented that in our Jenkins, basically on every develop build, we save the dump to Jenkins artifacts. And then on every PR build, we compare the dump for current branch with what's been saved on the latest develop build. You get a diff, and this diff is up to you to um, analyze, up to the developer to, to analyze whether a migration of events is needed or whether the change is well, insignificant enough that it doesn't uh, require a migration. So just setting up uh, some CI artifacts, and probably also we did um, it's also pretty useful to have some notifications on a, on a GitHub PR that changes are introduced and this might or might not be breaking. Please check. That's basically what we've done so far, pretty working pretty well. At least we are aware of changes introduced to uh, ACA persistence classes uh, so that we can react accordingly. Okay. Uh, so now handing over to Martin with the third part of a serialization helper, namely the serializer itself. There's not Jackson. Jackson is the caveat. Like using Jackson uh, is the, let's say, the pitfall of Hacker persistence. We provided a better alternative. Yes, thank you, Pavel, uh, for introducing. Indeed, Jackson is the uh, the serializer that is proposed in documentation to be used. Um, although it can be made to work, uh, it requires some, uh, some, it involves some pitfalls and may not be pain free. Uh, the problem with Jackson Akka serializer is that uh, simple code structures that are very natural in Scala uh, turn out to be a dangerous code that may end up uh, causing a runtime exception. And this is the, the main uh, problem that will uh, surface on this slide. For example, the simplest example of a dangerous code for Jackson is a simple case class message that includes, uh, that includes a sealed trait in its, um, in its uh, constructor. As it turns out, Jackson can't just construct animal. Uh, it doesn't detect that it was a trait. It doesn't have enough information during runtime and requires additional annotation just to serialize this simple case properly. This is, well, we're not, not, not so bad yet. You have, uh, I have three lines of uh, definitions and four lines of annot annotations. But unfortunately, it doesn't end here. Uh, the another example of a very dangerous code is, as you can see, a simple case object. Uh, case object don't have their um, 
are just normal classes in Java that um, that have a single instance. It's not in, in implemented in Java in any way. It's a typical Scala feature. And Jackson doesn't really know during write time that what is what it has is a singleton and should be singleton. So when we serialize this class, uh, sorry, this object, we get no exception during serialization. No, nothing bad happens. Everything continues smoothly. But what it may break is that instead of restoring the singleton, it creates another instance of our class. The result being that after sending the tick object as a message, we may or may not inside the actor, uh, this pattern matching may not trigger because the the tick will have two instances. So it may not be the same one and the message will be unhandled. Uh, the intended way to fix this is just not use case object. This is the, the solution they provide in official documentations. Pretty lame, but okay, we can still work with that. But what if we combine both of these uh, both of these pitfalls we will be using a trait and the case object the solution that is being proposed in documentation is to use custom serializer the serializers which sounds uh, pretty good until you actually think what it really is and in the end it's just glorified manual serialization and deserialization with uh, this code providing an example what is needed to just uh, serialize that simple case. And the question arises, why bother uh, after the serializer should help you uh, serialize the messages fast and carefree. But as it turns out, there are constructions uh, you can't use and uh, boilerplate code that says running very fast, out of control. So the solution is to change this serializer into something else. And we decided to create an ACCA serializer that's based on Cersei. Cersei has a um, very important advantage, advantage of deriving codecs at the compile time, meaning no surprises during runtime fully supports Scala types, including objects, case objects, seal traits, traits. Everything is covered because uh, in compile time you have more, just more information, but requires uh, mentioning that you want to serialize some type in code uh, in order to derive the codec, uh, the codecs. It doesn't derive codecs for all, only for the types you specify. So to implement, you just extend our just extend our serializer and provide uh, the top traits of commands that you want to be serialized. Commands, messages, states, everything's go in here. But there's also one caveat. What if you forget to register a code? This is the, the main danger of serializer that uh, depends on compile time. So we just created another magic annotation uh, that you annotate your serializer and give it a base trait, resulting in, in case you, you forget, an error. No codec found in the class annotated with serializer. And some message what may happen. What may actually happen is uh, depending on how you use your serializer. Thank you for your attention, and I think we'll be seeing each other again.